While they were fixing this, the drill pipe parted about 300 meters from surface. They got started pumping kill mud again with the bag and pipe rams holding the pipe and keeping the choke pressure down to prevent hydraulicking. That is the pipe being forced out of the well by the well pressure. The crew had been at it for over 12 hours and it looked like they would get control this time. The hole appeared to be full of heavy mud and everything looked good when the pipe started coming out of the well. The driller did his best to keep the traveling blocks ahead of the rising Kelly, but the Kelly bales came up and out of the hook. The Kelly fell out the V doors and down the ramp. When it reached the end of the Kelly hose slack, the hose broke off at the gooseneck and mud, gas, condensate and H2S was spraying up against the front of the substructure. Everyone abandoned the rig. After a 16-hour battle on the afternoon of October 17th, the blowout was underway. Mike Miller of Safety Boss answered Amico's call, arriving at the well site the evening of October 17th. The first plan of attack was to uh, try and shut in the Calicock, but the problem with doing that is, is that we knew that if we shut it in, uh, the drilling line that was on the ground would whip across the lease. So prior to attempting that, we would have to stake it down. Uh, so in other words, there was a lot of mechanics involved in going ahead with that operation. The flow was uh, of such a high rate that, that just the erosion from the flow alone drip washed right through the drill pipe that would have, which would be pipe of about three quarter inch wall thickness. The flow was extremely strong and it actually severed the pipe right at the drilling floor. If there's one word in the oil patch which makes everyone sit up and pay attention, it's the word blowout. It means there is an emergency situation. And for Amico, it meant the implementation of their plans for handling a major well site incident. This brought a special task force made up of skilled senior personnel into immediate action. Amico's general manager of production, Cheryl Moore, was proceeding with the implementation of the response plan. Well, any blowout is considered a, a real emergency and the lodge pole was maybe worse than some of the others because of the uh, large amount of condensate that was with the gas, plus the effect in the, of the hydrogen sulfide that was contained within this gas. While we were dealing with what we call a condition four, and that's an extremely serious well site incident, and our people know uh, exactly what to do when that type of a condition is identified. Immediately, the area around the well site was patrolled to ensure that no one was in the immediate vicinity of the well. Meanwhile, Amico personnel were notifying the Energy Resources Conservation Board and other regulatory agencies, such as the RCMP, Disaster Services, and Environment of the problem. In addition, Amico personnel contacted residents in the surrounding area, initially at Lodge Pole, which was in the direction of the then prevailing wind and at a lower elevation. They knocked on doors to advise people of the emergency at the well site, to gather information on the number of people in each home, and to determine whether they had a means of transportation. Residents were told that monitoring was already in place, and that they would be immediately notified should any evacuation become necessary. Amico then compiled a list showing the location of all residents and their telephone numbers. Three of the better-known well-taming companies are based in Houston, Texas. These wild well control experts comprise what must be the smallest but bravest industry in the world. They are on call to the whole world and ready to fly wherever a well runs wild. Amico called Joe Bowden of Wild Well Control Incorporated. We knew it was going to be a difficult well, but it was a well that we thought we could cap within three or four days at first. Uh, really, we had worked a plan up on the way up in our minds. Of, and uh, the reason we were able to do this is uh, the information that had been given to us. But it wasn't to be a three or four day job. First, the weather refused to cooperate. The winds died, and since H2S is heavier than air, the toxic gas blanketed the site. 
This necessitated the use of breathing apparatus, which slowed and complicated the work. On many days, work was prevented entirely. The wind would be favorable one minute, it would change directions, and then it would stay there, it seemed like the rest of the day. We found if we worked early in the morning, we had a good chance up to around 11 or 11.30 a day. Some days, uh, at the very first, it didn't matter which way we went, the wind would change, and uh, all the camp was evacuated. And that is when we had two stage areas and a base camp. They would all be evacuated. Then we built an, built an alternate route in, and then the other days it would block it and the other route. So uh, wind, uh, wind and weather was a big factor. These conditions put a great deal of pressure on Amoco safety coordinator, Ray Eshpeter. His major concern was to ensure that there was always a fallback position, a close at hand area where workers could breathe fresh air. On many days, there was not, and this prevented work entirely. Ray explains. That was one of the main reasons we had to wait till daylight all the time to go in so that we could see what the plume was doing. And at that point in time, if we couldn't maintain our, our safety backup people in clean, fresh air, we would have to pull our people off the lease and, in fact, shut the job down until the wind would be favorable for us to, to work in. And uh, sometimes that would last for 20 minutes and sometimes it would last for a whole day. So it really did slow the work down considerably. It was our biggest slowdown factor. Well, at the site, uh, Amico were, was responsible for the people on site. My particular responsibility was uh, to look after the safety requirements, uh, the equipment, the training programs, the communications. Amico's environmental group and, uh, worked uh, very closely with the government agencies in regards to looking after the residents around the location at, while we had the, uh, the well under, uh, out of control there, yeah. Joe's original plan, which I'll call Plan A, was to place a new BOP down over the drill pipe stub and bolt it to the annular preventer. To accomplish this, it was necessary to clear some of the equipment from the location and to build an access across the location to permit the moving of a crane through the condensate pools to the rig. The broken Kelly and the master bushings were removed using the crane and the operation readied only to be thwarted by the presence of a drill pipe stripper. The opening on this pipe cleaning device was too small to allow the BOP to pass through and attach to the annular BOP. The automatic drill pipe stripper is an assembly of flexible rubbers held tightly against the drill pipe by hydraulic arms. It is mounted in a heavy steel frame under the rig floor on a slide. As the drill pipe is pulled from the well, the rubbers strip off the slippery film of mud to facilitate handling the pipe on the rig floor. The rubbers can be opened to full hole size or closed off completely when the pipe is out of the way to provide a hole cover. When the drill pipe is out of the hole, 